Many entrepreneurs struggle with removing themselves from the center of their companies and focusing only on the tasks that will help their businesses turn the corner and take the next step. This is known as the hub and spoke business model. Well, our guest today will tell you why that model isn't sustainable for your company, but rather why it impedes your ability to grow your company in the right direction. She'll also tell us how to scale your business and help find your passion. Keep it locked. You can't afford to miss today's action-packed episode. Welcome to this edition of Peak Peak Performance Performance Podcast Podcast. with your host, Thor Conklin. Thor will be sharing the necessary tools, strategies, and psychology you'll need to become a peak performer in any area of your life or business. Thor Conklin here. We give you the tricks, the tips, the tools, the strategy, the technology, and the psychology peak performers use in order to get more done and execute at the highest level. If you know what to do but struggle with getting it all done or simply want to raise your game to the next level, this podcast is for you. Sit back and enjoy. Today's guest is Lori Winters, founder of Thread HCM, which provides mid-sized businesses with services for HR and payroll functions. Lori started Thread HCM after launching an outsourced accounting firm where she saw the need for assistance in HR and payroll functions. If you're struggling to find your niche or just want some tips, tricks, and tools for HR and payroll, then stay tuned. Lori is going to provide you with some valuable information to take your company to the next level. Lori, thank you so much for joining us today. I know the audience is excited to hear what you have to say. And, you know, it was interesting. The first thing that popped out on your resume was Georgia Tech football fan. (laughs) Last night, Georgia, the Bulldogs, were playing Alabama. Who'd you root for? Oh, my gosh. I was so conflicted with that game. I was so conflicted. I was raised a Georgia fan, but then went to Georgia Tech. And ever since, I've been an avid Georgia Tech fan. But uh, my whole family, they're all Georgia Tech. And so I was a little conflicted. I was I was pulling for Georgia most of the game and, until they started winning. And then, I, and then I turned. And I became a very big Alabama Roll Tide fan. <laughs> <laughs> well, it worked. <laughs> they it did, was a they, great game, though. No matter what. Yeah, they they did. I had a I had a root for the dogs. I, I've got more clients that are uh, dog alumni than Alabama alumni, so I, I got to stick with the clients. <laughs> <laughs> That's understandable. Yeah, I, I grew up in the Northeast, so of course football is not played on Saturday. It's played on uh, on, on Sunday. Sunday. You know, and, and and it's interesting because in. A lot of my career prior to moving down to Atlanta when I was in New York and I was working in private equity, you know, so many of the groups that I worked with, so many of the individuals all went to B school at Harvard, uh, Ivy League. But I tell you, Georgia Tech, I've never seen a school that has turned out what I think it or some of the brightest entrepreneurs I have ever met in my life. And I'm not, I'm not saying that because you're on this show. I'm just, I'm constantly amazed at the level of brilliance coming out of that school. What what are they doing in there? What are they feeding you guys? (laughs) Well, they used to make it very, very hard to survive. And I think that, you know, number one, what I, what I feel like I took away from there more than anything is the ability to learn quickly and to be very resourceful. And I say it all the time, you can never know everything. You just have to know how to go find out what the answer is. And you've got to be willing to fail and be resourceful. But they also made it really, really difficult. I felt like it was I was in the military a bit when it came to school. Um, I've heard some you know, rumors that maybe they support the kids a little bit better today, and maybe that's a good thing. But back then, we kind of, we, we prided ourselves on the fact that we had to just work unbelievable amounts of hours to just survive. So, I don't know. I think it's resourcefulness and, and just fighting through some failure and learning how to, you know, get back up and keep fighting. I love that. Now, was it the amount of work that they gave you or the time frames that they gave you to complete it? What, what was the, what's, what's changed or what was it like back then? Well, I think it was, there wasn't a lot of support as far as, you know, if you're struggling, you have a professor to maybe go talk to. Now they give a lot more support, which I think is probably a good thing, you know, more in the way of tutoring and help. Um, Back then it was, you know, the professors 
I think they were excited about failing a certain number of people. And so you just, ha it was survive, survive in advance, you know, and I think it wasn't necessarily, um, it was a lot of work, but it was, you had to really figure out how to survive the classes. And, and, you know, for most of us coming out of high school were good students. And, you know, my very first calculus exam or test, I think I got a 63 and I thought I was going to die. And then that turned out to be like a high B because of the, of the curve. So I, I finally looked around the room and I said, as long as I'm just a little bit better than some of these other people here, I'll be fine. Um, but it was just very difficult. I like it. It's kind of like weeding out the week, right? Let's exactly. make it really tough and <laughs> just get rid of the way. Well, look, you know, some of the best organizations in the world have that sort of mentality. Uh, the military, I mean, what you try to, you don't want to go to, into battle with someone who's standing next to you that is not going to be able to support you and have your back. So, I mean, Absolutely. you know, and, and I think we've gotten to the point in business where we've become so politically correct. It's like, okay, we all, we, we'll all make it. We all have to come along. No, there's going to be some people that need to be left behind, okay? They're exactly. going to be good in something else, but the organization that we have, we don't have that spot. We don't have the D spot. We don't have that C spot. Exactly. I 100% I agree, and I think you see that in everything, sports, business, um, school, it's just the nature is reality, you know, and I think um, the more that people learn that, you know, they have to fight a little bit harder and they've got to fail a little bit and get back up and, and fight some more, that is a great quality to have. That's what I look for in people and employees. That's what I've tried to, to teach my kids is, you know, you're not going to have it perfect. And it, as hard as it is to watch them fail sometimes, those are the things that I learn the most from. Yeah. So, yeah, I agree with you. Absolutely. Too politically I, correct nowadays. Yeah, I, I'm not very politically correct. You'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> Neither am I. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. And look, I get left behind all the time. Exactly. Singing, writing, uh, spelling. Oh, man, I'm in a group <laughs> all my own. You know, there, it's me and, and I don't know who's left, maybe like a third grader. Um, <laughs> it's, I don't know about the singing. I, I, I'm, I'm, I can't carry a tune. I, I'm, I'm horrible. Dancing. No. Not, not nope. going to make that one either. Uh, no, business, pretty good. Pretty good, yeah. And I think that that is so true. And it's you've got to figure out those one, or, one, two, or three things you're really, really good at and double down on that and that, forget the rest of the stuff. Yeah, I love that book. What, what, um, I'm going to mess up the title of it, but it's uh, Eagle School or Duck School or Duck Swimming School. All right, that's not the title, <laughs> but let me tell you what the book is. I think it's called Eagle School. And what it was is they had all these animals that went to this school, and the idea was they were teaching the other animals to do what the other people did. Like, so like the, the, the ostrich, they were teaching the ostrich how to swim like the fish. And then they were teaching the fish how to climb a tree like a frog. And it's like, you know, it just doesn't work. If you're a fish, be the best fish you can be. If you're a frog, be the best frog you can be. You climb trees. If you're an eagle, soar like an eagle. Don't try to swim like a fish. Um, Absolutely, and and we try to to create these well-rounded people um, in our organizations, and it just you know it just doesn't work. I remember working when I worked in New York. There was this guy. Uh, they, they, I swear they never let him out of a dungeon. We didn't even have a dungeon, <laughs> but it, it, his office was kind of like the dungeon. It's like it, go get Ralph. It's like oh, I'm not going in there. I don't know. It's like it's it was like a scene out of a, a, a King office novel space. or something. Yeah, it was like yeah, it was crazy. Did he have a red stapler? <laughs> <laughs> this is this is going back 25 years, the 30 years maybe. But this guy was brilliant and. You had to take him. He was a, he was an actuary, right? So I mean, he was just like oh, a, right. a phenom when it came to numbers. So <laughs> you, you talk to clients and go, "Look, um, here, here's our team, and there's another guy to the team that you probably won't see a lot. But if you do see him, we just want to let you know that he's just a little bit different than the rest of the people, right? <laughs> but he was great. You know, he, he had like the trousers that were. 18 sizes too big the belt was like practically down to his knee it's like that guy, I think at one th time the guy must have lost you know 300 pounds and never bought another <laughs> pair of uh, trousers um and, and, and lord knows when he last showered but man it's like his brain was like a computer um it, it, it was absolutely amazing I love that and put him in the play you know put him somewhere that he is uh he's good at and can thrive and you know, something along those lines, I think a, a strength of someone is something that someone is good at, but also they're a little bit passionate about, brings them energy. And, you know, that's what we try to do here is put people in positions where they're, you know, they have the aptitude, 
but they also are excited about it. Yeah. And then, then you've got a true, you know, star in that position and everybody is just so different. Yeah. There's some things that I, uh, that I'm really good at. It just, uh, I could tear apart a car literally. Right. And put it in a pile and put it all back together. I, I, I just don't want to do that, but I'm really good at that. So you got to find someone that want, is good at it and wants to do it at your that, firm. Go that's ahead. Me, yes. That's me with accounting. I'm good at numbers. I was an engineering major, but mm. I hate accounting with a passion. <laughs> all right. You got to explain that one. Well, to the point that when I meet with my CFO, one time I, I took a video of myself driving in just talking about how miserable I was feeling coming in to meet with him because I just don't like it. I hate accounting. I hate dealing with the accounting side. I, you know, and I'm in the payroll HR benefits business, but I don't like accounting. It doesn't make sense to me. I want to see the final numbers. I understand them really well, but I just don't like it. So it's not my strength. So did you post it on social media? I did not. I okay. sent it to him, though. I should. I should. I <laughs> well, should. I, I don't know. I'm just thinking this is like a new way to manage people. It's like, look, when you really don't want to meet with Bob, <laughs> just do a video and post it on the internet. I'm going in to see Bob. I hate meeting with Bob. I, I just hate doing with... this. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Love it. <laughs> That's great. I, oh, somebody out there is going to get sued uh, from our comments here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it would be very interesting, though. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So, so tell me. What are you really, really – now, I, I'm just going to warn you. Of course, you know what the second question is going to be after you're done answering this one. But what are you really good at and really passionate at at work? It's funny that you say that. So, you know, I've, I've tried to figure that out over the years, what I'm really, really good at, because as, as we've moved more from an entrepreneurial model – to a growth model in business, um, having to surround myself with people who are better than me at areas that I'm not good at. I've realized what I'm really not good at, there's a lot of things, um, but what I'm really good at is looking to the future, figuring out where we need to go, crafting a vision around that, and pulling a team together that believes in that, whether they should or not. <laughs> um, I think they, you know, getting those people to really believe in where we're going, I'm really good at that. Um, the other thing I, I believe that I'm really good at is looking at individuals and seeing what they're, what they are good at, and helping to invest in them, to grow them and put them in a position to be successful. So, who's the COO? The COO is someone named Matt Mitchum, who is incredibly good at process improvement. He's a process guy. In fact, he's a a Georgia grad, UGA grad. Whoa! So was, I was, that was yeah. going to be my next question. Do you have any UGA grads? Wow. I do. I do. Well, you know, you know what it is. See, you don't like doing what he has to do, so you're like, let me find a UGA grad and make them <laughs> miserable. I'm gonna make them do all that COO stuff. See, there, there's some logic behind this one. I know. Well, what's interesting is I brought him in originally to run sales, and um, you brought so the guy in to do sales, and now he's COO. He started out in sales, and then he moved into sales management, and he's very, you know, valuable to me, and I saw him as being a, a great process guy. We had, as a very small sales team originally, we had a process, a sales process, second to none. We didn't maybe need that process to be quite as uh, stringent, but he is a, an incredible process guy, and he and I uh, very much complement each other. So I saw the benefit of what he could bring to the table and wanted him to move into a bigger role, and, and he was willing to take that challenge and moved him into the COO role, and he's been incredible. So we make a great team. He, he you know, fills the gap where I'm not as good, and vice versa. He would say the same thing. I fill the gap where, where he is not as good. So it makes, I think you need, every company needs two people that are, you know, driven and good at those two different areas. I love it. Matt, uh, when you listen to this, ask for a raise. Now's the time, buddy. Now uh, strike <laughs> while the iron's hot. I mean, she's singing your praises. I know. He's going to love me now. Oh, I'm telling you. He's sad today, though. He's crying today. He's well. sad. He was at, he was at the game. Yeah, well, you know, just dock his pay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it sounded like, you know, I was being sarcastic there, which, of course, I can be from time to time, um, you know, because most COOs make really lousy salespeople. But it sounded like what you were saying is he put a process around the sales system and was actually pretty successful at it because there was a process to it. Is that correct? That is correct. Wow. That is, that is correct. 
Um, it, and, and, you know, and I, I saw the benefit of that. Uh, we needed that across the whole company. So um, gave him the opportunity to move into that other role. But yes, created a good process around the sales organization that exists today. And we're growing, you know, from that. So I think everybody needs that. You know, everybody needs a process. Sales isn't just going out and selling something. There's always a process around it, you know. Yeah, except for us true uh, salespeople, it's just like, come on, you know, somebody else will do the paperwork. Let me, let me just go get them. You know, let me close the deal and then let me, you know, bring them in and let's do the deal. And then it's like all the other stuff that has to do after the sale. It's like, ooh, you mean now? Now I've got to, now I've <laughs> got to like out something, right? Yeah, I've got to like be. Yeah, I've got to. You know. uh, it's it's always uh, interesting working with clients. You know, if they have. Uh, uh, intricate CRM systems, especially like a Salesforce or something. They're like, you know, I'll talk with the uh, the sales team, and they're like, "Yeah, management wants me to fill out all this stuff on Salesforce and plug all this stuff in." And it's like, we don't want to do that. Let me just go out and let me go find another one. Let me go find another prospect. Have somebody else well, do all the back end. And it's funny. That's why I I, I, be, I did believe that we needed to do a little bit less on the process side around sales. Um, I do think that you you have to have a process. But yes. when it comes to the paperwork side, you know, if you've got great salespeople in uh, specific roles, then there are there's room for uh, administrative type people to help with the stuff that the salespeople don't like. So we we really put people in in a role when it comes even to the sales side individual roles that are specialized and um, so yeah I agree with you on that no no great salespeople really wants to fill out paperwork and that's okay <laughs> <laughs> as long so, as they're selling that, that's that's right um, and, and you know what I love about this also is what you said you were great at is something that you can continue to grow with this company you're not going to get to the point where uh, you have kind of as the as the future, uh, someone looking for the future, looking at the vision and building the team, you can continue to do that to a hundred million dollar company. Uh, so it sounds like your position, you've got your position, and you can do something with that for the next thirty years. Absolutely, I hope so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it has been you know we started it from nothing, so it's been um, you know going from a very hub and spoke entrepreneurial model to you know, everybody reported to me to growing it into a, a team where you know teamwork mattered more and and then focusing on the future of you know where we go from now and always being willing I think that's the thing is learning that um, you know the older you get the more you realize you don't know and so putting people around you that can help you in areas that you're weak or that you need help in and being able to listen to that as long as you're willing to learn, I think you can always grow and, and you know, grow into any role um, when it comes to b building the business. But if you you get to the point where you think you know it all, then you're probably capped out. Yeah, and what happens so often, and it's interesting that you say the hub and spoke model because so often I got I have prospects come to me that are in this hub and spoke model, right? And they're doing 900,000, a million five, and they're at the center of everything and they can't figure out how to get out of the center. There's not enough right. money to bring in the talent that's necessary to remove themselves from it, and they're caught in this cycle where if they grow more, they're just inundated more. It's just, there's, there's a really interesting step um, around what I find. I've, it's a 900 to a million five is, is kind of that step in most industries, of course, depending on the profit margin and, and the organization. But did you find yourself, well, let me ask you this. When you found yourself at that moment when you knew that you had to get out of the middle, you obviously were able to do it successfully, which a lot of companies don't. This is where a lot of companies fail and people, you know, people come to me all the time and they're like, oh, what do you do? I'm a business owner. No, you're not. <laughs> you, you, you've got a job that you've created. You have a business, but you're not owning the business. The, the, the business owns you. You got out of the middle. How'd you do it? Oh my gosh. Well, I remember... Uh, reading a book one time, and there was there were many different books uh, along this line. You've read them all, I'm sure. Um, Vern Harnish, you yeah. know his, the Scaling Up and um, Rockefeller Habits, and there have been so many books like that that I read. And so I I do think always being willing to learn and ask others what they did to get through that. But I remember um, reading something, and I was saying I think this the author has a video camera in my office because it was talking about all the pains that I was dealing with at that point. 
And it was exactly where you're talking about. Everything came to me. I couldn't take any time off. Every, you know, I had to be, I was at the center of everything. Um, and and it, the, the discussion of that point of the business was called the whitewater stage. And that really hit me hard. I'm like, yes, I am right there. I'm in the whitewater stage. I'm either going to drown or I'm going to figure out how to get out of this. And so um, it wasn't, you know, quick. It wasn't easy, but it was a process that took time where whereby I started putting individuals in place that raising people up that maybe weren't quite ready for that role. Um, Matt Mitchum, I mentioned as my COO, he, I hired him two years out of college. So he has grown in this organization as we've grown. And sometimes people would say it's easier to go pick somebody from the industry and bring them in with the skill set. But he had the attitude, the loyalty, and, and the desire and culture fit that I really wanted. And so started giving, you know, individuals that I really trusted some additional um, responsibility, meeting with them on a regular basis and going through, you know, what do I do in this, you know, position and having them start taking some of that over. And it took a long, it took a long time. I mean, that was painful, very painful. And I know that I think businesses go through that over and over. So you have to be prepared for those types of growth opportunities and what are you going to do to, you know, to get from where you are to where you want to be. So I think it comes from what you're talking about, the hub and spoke entrepreneurial model where everybody reports to you and knows, and you know everything to the next level where you break through that, you know, million dollar mark and you start having a couple key people in place to take over parts of the business that you're just not that good at. And, um, you know, making sure that you coach them and meet with them and don't leave them hanging, which I probably did some. Um, you know, if there's been a mistake made, I've probably made it. But I've learned a lot through that. And then, you know, the next level of that, you know, then you need a, another another level of, uh, of uh, management and growth and deal with that. And, and you've got to start all over. So I think it, it's a continuous cycle. And, you know, businesses that can't, don't think about that as a continuous cycle end up failing at the at, at the end at some point so it's always being you know you always have to be revisiting that and learning yeah you need you need the right people and you know people yes. ask all the time they're like you know Thor, why are you a profitability consultant the whole reason to have profitability is that you can get the right people so you can get to a position where you're the owner and not the operator and right. In some businesses, it's really tough because the margins are so thin. That's that's you know after 18 years of owning my own business and, and looking at God thousands of different businesses, the one thing that strikes me if I have to look back is there's just some businesses you don't want to be in. It's, <laughs> I, it's you know uh, it's it's true. I, you know I remember. Um, in the early days, I used to help private equity firms uh, enter and exit deals. And during this was in, in the 90s, there was a bunch of them that were buying grocery stores. The margins on grocery stores are horrible, horrible. <laughs> it's three or four percent. I mean, you've got to do everything right just to make these things work. And just one thing goes wrong, they're, they're dead. There was more bankruptcies in these uh, grocery store deals than, than anything. And I don't know if you're like this, but I, I'm inflicted with this, I don't know, disease or, or issue that when I walk down a street, I don't care where it is, I'm always looking at the various businesses on Main Street or whatever. And I'm looking, I'm like, clothing store, 3,000 <laughs> square feet. Twenty-five dollars a square foot. Three employees. What? They're not making any money. You know? <laughs> do you do that yes, as well? I do it all the time. I, do it all the time. I, I thought it was only and me. I also because we we deal with a lot of uh, small businesses, small to mid-sized companies. Um, you get to see the different yes. industries and and what they're dealing with. And I'll look at a restaurant that opened up in a really bad location, and I just you know I I figure out okay I'll give that business you know six months or I'm thinking what were they thinking you know it when it comes to a restaurant it, it's location it's or a clothing store it's location and sometimes you just wonder what someone is thinking when they open up that business and in, in reality is they probably just didn't they don't have the benefit of the knowledge that you know we've we've gotten over time yeah and 
So I think about it all the time. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, there's some businesses based on my my experience that I definitely would not want to be a part of. But um, same reason, you know, very low profit margin, very very difficult hours, um, difficult clientele. Uh, just difficult to make money and, and survive. So there's a lot of those. It's it's difficult. Yeah. Yeah. So so here's a clue to the listening audience. If you have a business and you're switching CPAs and your CPA wants to get paid up front, you're probably not in a good business. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or if your payroll company wants you to wire them the money before your payroll runs, that's there you go. probably not in a good business. <laughs> there's your sign. <laughs> <laughs> run run <laughs> that's right <laughs> lose a little bit now or lose a lot later exactly thank you so much for listening today i really do appreciate your time and i hope you found today's show valuable if you would like to receive these shows automatically to your phone or to your computer simply go to itunes and subscribe after listening to several of the shows if you're so inclined, please leave us a five-star rating as this helps us reach additional people and spread the message. If you're truly committed to taking your life to the next level and doing whatever it takes to become a peak performer, but something's holding you back, something is blocking your way, and you just can't seem to figure out what it is, send me an email to info at and I'd be more than happy to get on the phone with you. We'll schedule a 15-minute discovery call, no obligation, no cost. I absolutely love to hear from the listeners. And if there's something I can do to help, I'd be more than happy to do that. Also, if you found something of great interest in today's show and you want to share that with your friends and family, simply go to my Facebook page, Thor Conklin. Click on the episode, hit the share button, and share it on your page. You can follow me at Twitter at Thor Conklin. The website is ThorConklin.com. We're constantly adding new free resources discussing additional tricks, tips, tools, and strategies on how to be a peak performer. Remember, I try to keep these episodes short so you can listen to them during dot time, doing other things, commuting, driving, walking, working out. Decide to be a peak performer in all that you do. And until tomorrow, have an absolutely amazing day. Be on the lookout for part two of our conversation with Lori, where she tells us how engaging your employees can lead to better business results as well as why you can't be everything for everybody. I'll see you guys on another edition of Peak Performers Podcast.